there is nothing wrong with your internet, do not attempt to adjust your settings. We are controlling the podcast. We control the squealing and the screams. We can make your heart flutter, your eyes blur from tears, or sharpen your mind to crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit back. We are in control of what you hear. We repeat, there is nothing wrong with your settings. You are about to experience the awe and mystery known as the female mind. You are now entering the Fangirl Zone. We will continue exploring, discovering new worlds and new civilization. Welcome to the Captain's Chair, a podcast on all shows in the Star Trek universe on the Fangirl Zone. I'm Chief Engineer Steve, and joining me on this mission into the unknown is... I'm Redshirt Dave, and there are no more red shirts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the boot. Tonight we'll be discussing episode one of season three of Star Trek Discovery. What an episode. Yeah, it was pretty good. Some of the directorial choices at the beginning left me uh, scratching my head. I didn't agree with them. I didn't like Burnham's depiction of herself or whatever, or her reactions to stuff. We can get into that. Otherwise, it was pretty good. Yeah, I thought Sonequa did a fantastic job of acting in this episode. Boy, did she really show her range. Yeah, I think that was the intention of the director. Do we have the director? I can pick yeah, it up. Yeah, it was Olatande. Yeah. Again. I, I think they wanted to stretch her acting chops. Right. Uh, to me, it went a little overboard. You know, we've seen her and we've seen Burnham and other things. It didn't freak her out like that. Right. I mean, we're we're talking about someone that's beamed aboard Klingon cruisers, not to mention uh, traveling to alternate dimensions. Right. <laughs> but this freaked her out, and I thought it was a little over the top. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we do have some news. Just a couple days ago, the cast and showrunners announced that production on season four begins November second. Wow. So that's great news. Yeah, we'll, we'll see that. We're looking into the future already. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about our new cast members, Dave? Sure. So David Ajala as Cleveland Book Booker. Book is a 32nd century courier who owns a cat named Grudge and becomes a close ally of Michael Burnham. Ajala starred in Supergirl and Night Flyers. I remember from Supergirl. Ah, he could portray Superman if he wanted yes. to. <laughs> we were discussing before we went on air that he managed to get his shirt off. Yeah. <laughs> Good reason. Yeah. <laughs> the difference between him and me is that he has more chest hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was also in Night Flyers, which Sean yeah. and I did a podcast on. So, yeah, interested in that show. You can check it out. Yeah. I mean, did he take his shirt off? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Oops, it fell off. Now, one more thing about David Ajala. He is classically trained, British, of course. Yeah. And performed Hamlet with uh, Sir Patrick Stewart. Oh, yeah. And it was uh, Patrick Stewart's suggestion that he look into Star Trek. So that kind of brought him into the fandom. And I have a feeling that Sir Patrick actually made a suggestion to the showrunners that they bring David on board because he was actually called for his audition. He didn't even have to go apply for it. They called him to come in and audition for uh, it. Yeah. How come I don't get phone calls like yes. that? Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we need an alien that looks like a bug to get squished in the first 30 seconds. <laughs> we thought of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, good for him. He reminds me of Luther. Yes. That, the British TV show. Pretty awesome. Deep, gravelly British voice, a deep bass. Handsome. Yeah. <laughs> we also have a Blue DeBario as Adira. Adira is a 32nd century human who joins the crew of Discovery. Blue DeBario is Star Trek's first non binary actor, and Star Trek Discovery is her first acting credit. Wow. Yeah, what a way to start. I know. <laughs> Just throwing you in there. Good luck. Ian Alexander as Gray. Gray is a Trill, who is Adira's uh, closest friend and in the universe. And Alexander is Star Trek's first transgender actor who previously starred in the OA, one of my favorite series. Episode one is The Hope Is You, part one. Burnham navigates a strange new world. Haha, <laughs> no. A strange yeah. new galaxy, <laughs> 930 years in the future. 
looking for the rest of the Discovery crew. Well, Pretty after cool. a brief teaser we will pick up on later, Season 3 drops us right back into the action of the Season 2 finale. Drops her, literally. Yes. Burnham emerges from the chaos of the battle with Control on one end of the time-traveling wormhole, only to find herself in the middle of a exciting quip lace space chase <laughs> on the other slamming her red angel suit smack dab into the chase ship flown by one cleveland book booker sending his freighter and her time suit crashing to the planet below welcome to 3188 michael i liked his booker ship it's like off center or offset it's right that, you know we're used to everything being linear including you know klingon ships and even Romulan and certainly Federation. But this was off center in that he's a little like Han Solo, you know, roguish. Oh, yes. And uh, Millennium Falcon was a little off center, too. You didn't, That bridge on that was off on a nodule on the starboard side. Right. So pretty cool. Yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that awesome ship <laughs> a little <laughs> later. Now, of course, after barely surviving the crash landing, the versatile and talkative suit delivers <laughs> some good news. <laughs> They are actually in 3188, and there are multiple life signs detected. Yeah, couldn't tell that by looking around. No, <laughs> and talk about amazing. They went up to Iceland to film this episode, and boy, it sure looked like nowhere we'd ever been before. Yeah, I like that volcanic soil. Yes. Now, of course, Burnham notices the wormhole closing, so... She orders a suit back through the wormhole to send her brother Spock that promised final red burst signal in the 23rd century. So I was just thinking, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if wouldn't Sooty, as you called him, or the Red Angel suit, if that could tap into the year 3188, shouldn't the knowledge, shouldn't it have the knowledge that she was successful already? Right, because it's in the past, even though she hasn't done it yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll stop thinking. Now, this bit of business nicely ties up some loose ends from season two and literally puts the Red Angel and all that stuff behind Michael, but also nails down how it was a one-way trip. <laughs> and we get more information about the possibility of returning home later. Now, yep. of course, after her brief, infectious moment of triumph, Michael finds herself truly alone, and it doesn't look like we're on the intended target of Terra Elysium. But the, in the magnificent desolation of some uh, a other alien planet, wow, like I said, we, we love that location in Ireland. It's mm. awesome. Iceland. Yeah, Iceland. You'd rather be in Ireland. Yeah, I'd rather be in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with Discovery nowhere to be found, all she has to hold on to is a sparse field kit and a mantra. Name, rank, and Starfleet serial number. I'm not sure that's going to do her much good in this time. <laughs> <laughs> that was another thing I shook my head at. It was just, a, I don't know, a script or a directorial choice, though she keeps repeating that. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no better options. She heads to the ship she smacked into, only to run smack into an angry captain who wants nothing to do with her. Yeah. Great fight scene. Yep. And they finally come to a accord because Burnham finally gets the phaser in his face. <laughs> Get that antique out of my face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she needs a way to communicate with Discovery, and he needs dilithium to get his ship off the ground, but he is space broke. <laughs> space broke. I oh, know, that's a new one. Space broke. Yeah, that's <laughs> probably not too good. <laughs> First sign of not being able to trust this guy. When she was hurtling through space... I guess before they collided, collided, you could see all the wreckage of uh, yes. starships. Yes. I couldn't pick out any numbers. No, on, a, on any of them. And but I'm pretty sure as she came crashing down to the planet's surface, you could see an Intrepid class ship sitting in that crater. Did you see it? No, I missed that. Yeah, go back. I will. <laughs> yeah. So at least those last a long time. I mean, what was the burn like? 120 years ago or something right, like yes. that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Sure looked like it to me. I went, hold it. I went back a few times like, yep. <laughs> uh, that may come in real handy. Yeah, it might. If she, I know it looks to be in one piece because everything else is like crumbled cookies in outer space. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so for that reason alone, almost certainly not, but it's all she can do. So off they head to the space market to trade her space antiques 
Mm-hmm. Get him some rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Get him some rocks. <laughs> yeah, they went to this alien mercantile, and I got a real vibe from the movie AI where they had the flesh fair because everything was so out of this world and colorful and carnival like. So uh, it gave Sonequa Martin Green and David Ashala, they quickly fall into some promising chemistry. You know what you think? Yeah. <laughs> As Bert starts with the exposition we've all been waiting for, delivered impressively by someone. New to all this techno babble. <laughs> Turns out the Federation collapsed about a century before, not long after something called a burn. And they keep repeating to her, How do you not know this? Right. <laughs> I'm the time traveler, damn it. Yeah. Can't you tell? <laughs> in the uh, late 31st century, most of the dilithium in the galaxy has exploded, and thus warp travel has become very difficult. Not entirely eliminated. Uh, and we learn later there's a couple of starships out there. Right. It's very interesting. What are they doing? And if they have two, who else has a, f- a few? Right. And are they are they fighting? And apparently only the uh, true believers talk of the good old days of the Federation. That's kind of haunting. Yes. When she first re- received the news, she was like stunned. You can see her do the old face quiver like, that can't be true. Right. But it did light a torch in her. But it'll give her something to burn for. <laughs> 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 you know, telling her that this, there's a technological and societal collapse has taken down this interstellar institution at the core of her being, gives her a new to-do list. And by the way, Book waves his hand over the one-way trip to the future, informing us that all time travel technology was destroyed and outlawed in the temporal wars. And then I thought to myself, huh, that's interesting, Steve. Who enforces that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even enforce the Species Protection Act of the future. Right. So who the heck is in- enforcing the non-time travel yeah. edict? I would say nobody. <laughs> Maybe that'll be reintroduced. I believe we will see it again. And also, uh, the Gorn got a nice little mention. They recently destroyed two full light years of subspace. <laughs> how do you how do you do that? Right. <laughs> that's <Mega> breaking. <particle. laughs> yeah, that's breaking something. All right. Oops. Well, we got to go. Bye. Yeah. Uh, Michael has no time re- to regret giving up what she might be the only hope for ever returning home to the 23rd century. She now has a whole new century to save. <laughs> sure does. It's like the title is named after that hope is you. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. No. Interesting that it's part one and looking through the episode list, there is yeah. no part two for this there episode. There is no part so two. Yeah. That may be the, the finale of the season or uh, not this season, but next season, maybe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, the bulk of the episode plays out with this unlikely pair finagling their way into the high security market pull off their trade. Now, of course, to drive home the point that things are different in the 32nd century, this place is run by an alliance of Orions and Andorians. Yeah. That would never happen in the 23rd century. (laughs) That's, uh, Like honor among thieves. Exactly. (laughs) Now, of course, Book is a regular in this nicely detailed, future yet familiar hologram filled auction house. Yeah, it kind of reminded me a little bit of Hmm? the Bruce Willis, uh, the ninth element. Oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Now, he reveals himself to be a courier delivering the goods sold here in return for barely enough dilithium for the next job. Who's scruffy? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's a shame we didn't hear Scruffy Nerf Herder here. <laughs> oh, that would have been awesome. Yeah. And of course, he fits in with all the unsavory characters. So to no one's surprise, Cleveland double crosses Michael to take <laughs> all her antiques, leaving her under arrest and interrogated by the and- Andorian Orion comedy duo turned tough guys. <laughs> I know. I, I did. I thought those guys were awesome. I oh, we yes. See, I hope we see him again. Uh, they argue to each other. They don't seem like the brightest bulbs either. No. <laughs> That's what they adore in. Yeah. And do I? Yes, you do. <laughs> and this all leads to the funniest and fastest bit of character development Burnham has ever experienced, all thanks to a mind-altering drug they gave her to spill the beans on book, which she promptly does. Yeah. She also uses this trip to get in some much-needed reflection with the epiphany, I'm so supportive, I'm overcompensating, (laughs) and I'm done being reflexively supportive. But her bragging, I saved all things, shows Michael still needs some more time on the old space couch. But I agree with her, don't ever get Tilly near this drug. (laughs) Oh my god, can you imagine? Yeah. 
<laughs> she, I, I must say, I didn't like the earlier Burnham stuff where she's a little sad or screaming, but I love her when she's high. Oh, yeah. That was, that, that was awesome. <laughs> she should do a, a, a guest bit on our last show we, we discovered, Lower Decks. <laughs> oh, yeah. That'd been great. <laughs> And it's not too long until everyone is pointing cool guns at each other, including that Cosmos guy from the chase scene. And we really get to see the connection between Burnham and Book, because he just gives her a look. Yeah. And she knows exactly what he's thinking. And yep. they go to town. <laughs> Got another awesome fight sequence. Yes. It Great turns, choreography. Yeah, it turns out Book stole Cosmos's cargo, which he stole from someone else. Of course. So, of course, we have this awesome fight scene, shooting everywhere, taking out a lot of the thugs. Burnham is still high, of course, and she notices a large amount of dilithium. So, what does she do? She goes in and snags it all. You know what, Steve? Uh, when those weapons were blasting, they were making holes and stuff, you know, yes. like in the whatever counts as glass yeah. or whatever. Then or like burn holes and stuff. And uh, that's great. That's a new that's new to us. But we we saw it in Picard when blasters would you know, when they at the very beginning at uh, that. Uh, what do they call it? The Martian yard, the shipyard. Yes. Yeah. Martian and and the la- yeah, and it would blast through stuff. And I always wonder, shouldn't that be blasting through the door into the wall on the other side? And they started to show that. So these things are pretty powerful. Right. And they managed to escape with another new fancy 32nd century gadget, personal transporters. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. You know, I don't think they're yeah. going to go into that. No. <laughs> oh, really? I was thinking to myself, yeah, how? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it wasn't so much how is that you can still be tracked. Yeah. You know, because, yeah, they make it out of the out of Requiem, but every time they pop up, within seconds, the <laughs> people that are chasing them pops right up, too. That's the 32nd uh, century's answer to end program, if you don't like something. Right. End program? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this time, how, what's to prevent you from activating someone else's transporter? Oh, yeah, no doubt. Uh, is it biometric somehow? Yes. <laughs> to I'll, protect it? That, it'd have to be. But, yeah, I could definitely see that. You know, you just run up to somebody and it isn't yeah. aware that you're there and just go, boop, hit their transporter <laughs> like, and off they go. <laughs> standing on the edge of a volcano with a dinosaur looking at you. Ah, yeah. crap. <laughs> Well, they do kind of get into that situation, and yeah. Book's decision was highly questionable as he grabs Burnham and they jump off a cliff. You go, mm. what the hell? But of course, he transports them into the water, come out, and we see that Burnham has been shot in the arm. First time she's been shot in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Then we see Book go to work. He's got to take his shirt off first, of course. Yeah. And then he kind of gets into this pose. (laughs) And we see his forehead light up as he's chanting alien words that nobody knows what they mean. Yeah, it wasn't on subtitles. (laughs) Yeah, no, it was just alien chant, alien language. And we see this plant come out of the lake, and apparently he knows that it has some salve that will help heal Burnham's wound. Yeah, it's got some bite to it. Yeah, just a little. (laughs) Yeah. Ouchie. Now, of course, the gaggle of goons catch up with our heroes and demand that the cargo be returned. And we find out that the cargo happens to be a giant transworm. Shades of Dune. Yes, (laughs) very much. And we get the (sighs) book telling... Burnham to close her eyes, just, mm-hmm. and we find out why, as the transworm mesmerizes bad guys and basically <laughs> eats them whole. <laughs> you go, oh, uh, no! <laughs> so some of them beamed away. Did our favorite Heckle and Jekyll and Lauren Hardy make it? The Andorian and the Orion? They had to. I think so. I, I mean, it looked real quick. I could see some Andorians escape. Right. But I'm not sure about it. Ithic and Ithor. Right. <laughs> now, of course, this worm goes after Burnham as well, but yeah. Book convinces it to not finish eating her. <laughs> yeah. And she 
spit back out. Yeah, that reminds me of a few things. It reminds me of a recent episode of The Boys where someone was on the in the interior of a whale, and <laughs> it was kind of gunky. We didn't get to see the interior here, but what was that? Uh, what was that crazy movie with the giant robots that were like stepping through the uh, Pacific Ocean and beating the heck out of each other and beating the heck out of these monsters from another dimension? Because somebody got swallowed by one of those things and spit what, out Pacific later Rim, too. Maybe. Yeah, Pacific Rim. Thank you. Yeah. Burnham's lucky. Who knows what kind of digestive juices? I thought I was going to spit her into the water. You know, yeah. the water's right there. You should have just spit her in the water and clean her off. She's awfully gunkified. Yes. <laughs> yeah, she's so, just having the weirdest day and a whole lot of fun watching it all happen to her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and we little, learn a little more about Book. Uh, he's not just a roguish freighter pilot, but I'd say, Steve, pretty close. Oh, pretty yeah. close. He is a courier. Yes. It, very it a, Han Solo-ish. <laughs> yeah, very Han Solo-ish. So, right down to the leather the jacket, too. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's good to see that leather still, or pleather, or whatever it is, is still in fashion <laughs> in the 32nd century. Right. Complete with the upturned collar, because you know. Yeah. That's what the cool guys have. Yes. I mean, the, that must be the Fonz influence yeah. in the 32nd century. <laughs> oh, sorry, boomer talk. Yeah. <laughs> Who's Fonz? What is this Fonz you speak of? I was wondering, uh, when he started, I don't know, praying that thing out of the water, he had some type of embedded tech in his forehead that glowed? It sure looked that way. It looked is it embedded tech or is that part <laughs> Or, yeah, or is he, or was he, is that part of his biology? I mean, maybe he's got a, a, a hunter killer, and like, I guess the rest of his family are poachers, and they use it to hunt these anything down, apparently. Right, he's, yes. He's the black sheep of the family. So he uses it, this power, whatever it is, for good. So is he not of Earth, I suppose? It's I don't even very think they, possible. Yeah, he's humanoid, but I don't think they really mention where he's from you can let us know if he if they did no i don't think he mentioned the name of his home planet i don't think they mentioned earth at all no they didn't yeah it's surprising that uh, Bert didn't say uh so <laughs> how's earth right <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions to be answered so he's also got a big fat cat named grudge <laughs> who he says is a queen uh, it's also good to what yeah this was amazing because it makes you think okay is this cat something besides yeah. just a cat? Yeah. But if you've ever had cats, you know they're queen. They yeah. do what they want when they want. <laughs> yep. Nothing you can do. They aren't dogs. They're cats. <laughs> and they, uh, he said how he's large, or she said he's uh, large for a cat. I wonder if this cat's been downsized and its ori original size is something like the size of his spaceship right. or something. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. That would <laughs> honey, be awesome. <laughs> honey, I shrunk the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Down to a 25 pounds, 40 yeah. inch long monster. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Queen. Yeah. Now, how. What do you think about the interior of the ship? Oh, I have a. I like the new Touch 3D. Yes. Uh, tactile. Panel. Yes. That interface was... to like the comms. Yes, that was it, amazing. Yeah, that is weird. It makes you wonder why. Well, but yeah. uh, you know the suit and and book also had a hologram with touch screen. Right. You know, they're always swiping their hands around and activating something. Now, I, I did think it was odd in the beginning of the episode where. Burnham is talking to her suit and not, I mean, after the fall, she's accessing and she steps it out. And so she brings up the, well, I guess it's a hollow screen. Yep. And she's wiping her hands across it and she's also speaking to it. And I'm like, well, make up your mind, lady. I can speak to my phone. Right. And I, I don't have to touch it. So you're behind. <laughs> I can, my phone will tell me, I'll tell my phone what it wants to do. Okay. It does tell me what I should do sometimes too. Yes. <laughs> but but it, you're either touching it to get it to work or you can speak into it. But why do both? Right. Well, we kind of saw that with Picard too on, on that ship yeah. where you had yeah. the physical interface as well as the verbal interface so yeah yeah why both yeah <laughs> that's just again that maybe that's just me but the reach out tactile which is also look like what was his name sahil yes his bed yes first of all first of all matter. yes yeah i uh i want a bird clock 
Yes. <laughs> it just sits there and tweets until you like touch it. And I don't know, a melting bed? Do I want a melting bed? I'm not sure. <laughs> With my luck, I'd forget to activate it. I would just like float through the air until I hit the ground. <laughs> All right, well, eventually these two crazy kids uh, bond over each other. And if you watch the uh, previews for the upcoming season, I think the bonding takes a step up. Oh, <laughs> I'm just, yeah. just saying. <laughs> Put up the uh, Federation around to protect those in need. Book's brand of saving the space worms will, will do in a pinch. And then the space worm, didn't he call it Molly? I don't yes. know if he did. Yes, yeah, Molly. Molly. I should look into the, like, what, what else is the meaning for Molly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He also wins some points for recognizing all she has given up to save the future than the future he lives in. Yeah, okay, a future, though. Yeah, a future. A future. He first takes her to Sanctuary 4 to sort of refuge for transforms and like-minded alien animal lovers, which I also want to go to. Yes. <laughs> I, and and it, that's when I noticed all the characters of color. Yeah. Are all the good people. And there's yes. no right, white, white people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> around to screw things up. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're green or blue. Right. <laughs> those those people didn't do that well either. But I, I guess we get an indication that there are like-minded people looking for a federation to come back. Someone's got to enforce the rules. Exactly. Endangered Species Act, etc. Speaking of which, it's time to return to that brief teaser where we saw a soul figure dutifully manning some kind of facility, like a lonely Maytag repairman is left <laughs> by by the Federation. It turns out a book knows about this abandoned relay station, and they use it to meet Federation liaison Ditya Sahil. Bree feels well up as he addresses them with, Welcome to Star, please. May I help you? Oh, boy. And she chokes out her mantra of name, rank, and serial number, so it's a good thing she memorized that. <laughs> <laughs> this was veteran Indian actor Adil Hussein, who I liked immediately. <laughs> oh, yes. He really killed it as a tragic and yet delightful man. He tells the story of waiting decades for someone that, again, like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, he's like a crusader knight just yes. waiting on... I knew you'd come. Yes. <laughs> and he's been holding his Federation flag forever. Not exactly at the cup of Christ, but uh, maybe right. to them it is. <laughs> we learn from him that the communication center rate is limited, and there's only two Federation ships detected within a 600-year light radius, and neither is Discovery. I wish they had shown. Did they show that on the map? I didn't see that. No, like, no. We where didn't the see it. But... No. I wonder yeah. why not. We, we don't even know what sector they're in. No, we don't. We have you, no you don't, clue you where think, they are. <laughs> are they flying together? Do they know where each other are? Are they even Federation? Are they ships that were abandoned and who knows mm. to come over? Yeah, maybe. It could be that Discovery is too far away to detect or even worse. It may not arrive for years or centuries. Yes. That's kind of a gut punch. I don't know why it didn't dawn on her then. We right. saw that in uh, the Chris Pine uh, Star Trek yes, movie. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, when Spock you can come up late, what, centuries late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, clearly Michael and Book and the Discovery uh, crew were bound to show up at some point are going to have their work out for them. So it's a good thing she nabbed all that dilithium. <laughs> Bonus. And uh, I thought it was kind of touching when Vernon commissions uh, Sahil into Starfleet to join their cause and the rest of the true believers. Yeah, and I have to give points to the score, too, because i got to uh, love that uh, rousing type of theme that comes yes. up in the background. Yeah. You're not going to get a – if you're a Star Trek fan, you won't have a dry eye. No. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Our numbers may be few, but our spirit is undiminished. Sniff. Yeah, good so, way to end the episode, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's always hope. <laughs> And that, I hope, is you, Burnham. Yeah. Oprah. <laughs> so I got some Easter eggs and some, a little boomer talk. Not that we haven't already, yeah. <laughs> touched on it already. Sorry. Uh, this is the first Star Trek episode ever without a white male or female human character. Hooray. Yes. <laughs> I thought it was a good touch. I really liked it. And we also know the book's going to be a series regular because his ship was added to the opening credits. Nice. Yes. You don't want to, you don't want to uh, not add all that talent anyway. That's right. <laughs> you also see an army of dot sevens, which tweaks my interest in how Star Trek sort short Trek season. Wow, that's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> Ephraim and the dot is going to be tied into this season. I wonder. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. I, it just came out of nowhere and it was like, what? <laughs> yeah. And the pl planet that Burnham lands on is initially called Hema. What do you suppose behind that? Anything? Is it changing like there's no sheriff in town, so you can call it what you want, or it's not part of a uh, sector? Well, huh. yeah, I don't know. It, yeah. You know, because well, Requiem was above the, a city, mm -hmm. so you would think there's got to be some kind of law for that city, maybe. 
I mean, I guess not. Yeah, the, but... the law of the West, I know. Yeah. Uh, could it be that the Orions and uh, and Dorians are the law? Good God. Yeah, that, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cosmo uh, is a Betel Goisian or Betel Juicy, and I kind of yeah. prefer that. <laughs> it's a series invented in Star Trek The Motion Picture, and he was played by David Benjamin Tomlinson, who's Linus in season two of Discovery. He also played Troy in Open Black. And you know what, Steve? You know what Linus is famous for in season two of Discovery? Sneezing all yes. over. Uh, yes. <laughs> this big goopy slop right all over it. I thought that was awesome. Yes. <laughs> oh, and Star Trek Voyager, what? Did you have something to add? Yeah, about, no, he just uh, had sinus issues. <laughs> yeah, he had sinus issues. <laughs> Star Trek Voyager's Omega Directive, the destabilized Omega Molecule, irreparably damages subspace, rendering warp travel impossible. So, hint, hint. And as first we heard of the Temporal Wars was on Enterprise. Because we'll have to learn more about that. Yes. And the thugs employed by the Andorans and Orions included a Tellarite and a Lurian, like Bourne, and some cool new aliens. Always up for uh, cool new aliens. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm very interested to see if we learn more about Book's weird, almost druidic connection to natural life with whatever those glowing lights are under his skin, maybe a biological evolution, as we spoke of earlier. I wonder if it's a family trait or like uh, like you thought, a genetic enhancement. Right. Uh, yeah, I, it would be weird that to have that type of uh, ability and be a poacher. I mean, it wouldn't do them any good. Unless it's just they use it for hunting, you know, because they have that a sense. Well, that's true. You could sense use the that ability to find Bring what out. you're looking for, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, likewise, there are some very cool little technological leaps in this episode that makes it still feel trekky. But there's also there has been an advancement of time and te technological iteration. The UI on a book's video screen is very cool, and it is a weird. A uh, haptic interface of this console, and then there were a few seemingly universal phaser designs used by security at the trading outpost. One size fits all. Yeah, those things, we'll have to get them up with a name. Somebody will probably tell us eventually. Right. Yeah. Hand blaster? Hand blaster? I don't yeah. know. One of the coolest things that was introduced is instant transporting. Maybe it's a small thing, but Trex had the concept of being people out forever or up. The idea of personalized instant transport tech suddenly blows so many of those preconceptions out of the water. It's uh, being used in this episode to aid what is basically a very fancy chase sequence of both incredibly rad and also scratching the surface of what to expect out of it. And it's also good for uh, practical jokes, as we discussed earlier. What oh, if you absolutely. wanted to send somebody away? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have to be, I don't know, I don't get it. I, I don't, I have a feeling they're not going to explain how it works. Right. That would be too much. Yeah. Even the holodeck needs hollow emitters. Yes. Is it biologic? Oh, now I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. Never mind. There was a few other uh, Easter eggs I can elucidate to that ship that was chasing. Hey, do we know the name of Book Ship? No. Does it have a name? Get a name. Huh. Anyway, chasing Book Ship. Remind me of the, uh, the ship from Interstellar. It yeah. just seemed to be like a pronged hope-like ship with things spinning around. I liked how Burnham rose out of the, rose out of the ash. Hey, she's the phoenix. Yes. <laughs> Just like Sandra Bullock did at the end of Gravity. It was really heroic. Right. That, that was the end of that movie where she rose up, like almost like the first person on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and then when uh, Burnham did it, it was like she was the only person on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> I liked uh, the Iron Man suit that uh, Burnham had, too, that she could step out as very Avengers Iron Man. Oh, yes, absolutely. And let's see. That Requiem, oh, as I mentioned earlier, remind me of the Flesh Fair from AI. And Cosmo, whom we just spoke of, he looked like an orc yeah. to me <laughs> from did. Lord of the Rings. He was very orky. You know, they get, they kind of had like gravelly, like drooly sound to him, like, uh, you know, I'm evil because I talk that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that blaster that they, they, they used, that's just basically like a, this blue shock wave that just blows everybody back. Right. Literally. That kind of reminds me of the Avengers too, like Wanda. She we should just hold yeah. out her hands and yeah. zap, you know, everyone would go flying. And I, I got a little vibe from Avatar, the movies too, with that, that flower that came out of the water. And Book did that little ceremony. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that was cool, especially because it was like that neon glow to it. Yep. Very colorful. But uh, you know what I thought of? What happened to the Q? When he was talking about time travel being outlawed, you know, and we wondered just earlier, oh, yeah, who, who enforced that? 
<laughs> right. You know, yeah. <laughs> funny. But no one's enforcing the Endangered Species Act, and no one's enforcing that, too. But so it made me think, well, where'd the Q go? Aren't they basically immortal? Where'd they go? Right. Are they just on the outside looking in? They can't but be bothered anymore? I don't know. Huh, that's and, a good question. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> when Book told, ah, what's our friend's name? Burnham. Sorry. To close your eyes, I remember you know, Raiders of the Lost. Sorry. Yeah. You know, close your eyes, Marion. You don't want the ghost to get you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I started, in my notes, I started to refer to him as Saint Book. Because <laughs> he was just like too perfect. Yeah. All right. Steve, I've got a tinfoil hat theory. All right, let's get into it. Okay. Throughout the episode, I think we got subtle hints on how the burn, as in Burnham, happened. Right. I think it's her fault. Whoa, hold on she, here. <laughs> I think Burnham caused the burn, and maybe these people don't even realize why they call it the burn, because Burnham caused it. It could be something she did with that red angel suit, or something she did in conjunction with control, unknowingly, of course. And we're talking about trans warp, trans dimensional travel. And she did say at the end, well, I fixed a future. Like, if you believe in string theory and the rest, it could be multiple futures out there. Who knows which one she landed in? Oh, absolutely. And, and if you can tr save a future, can't you uh, save a past too to go along with it? If we f if we if we find out that she was, you know, not deliberately at fault for calling causing. Uh, this burn after Burnham. I was wondering about the the Red Angel, and I think we saw red dilithium crystals yes. in the opening credits. So with, I can't remember if they were red before. I'll have to go back and look. But it could signify that, that it's something, it had something to do. I mean, first, because it's just a nod to whatever happens to dilithium. And you'd think ships in the 31st or 32nd century would be able to detect something going wrong with the dilithium dilithium crystals, but that's me nitpicking again. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it should be software like say, hey, shut everything off right now or it's yeah. going to blow up. Or you're going <laughs> but, to go boom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there it is, Steve. What do you think? Tinfoil hat there. Burn it. It's all Burnham's fault. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a, a, an interesting possibility because, yeah, there was, you know, we saw that her traveling through that transwarp wormhole. Yep. And there was just all kinds of stuff going on in there. So, yeah, it, maybe it is possible. Or it was something in a different past timeline that actually it, caused it to happen. Maybe controlled yeah. it. Maybe, yeah. you know, she wasn't, she, she failed in her attempt to, stop control in that uh, in an alternate timeline and control is the one who ended up causing the burn in this timeline right so, yeah it's going to be interesting to get more information on this burn as time goes yeah. on that's for sure i question my own theory in that uh, i i don't know she has enough everything the hope is on her which is another clue yes. the hope could be her hope to her to fix it too yeah but that, that's a lot to put on her shoulders i'm not sure they want to do that to that character but hey why not? Yeah. <laughs> We've seen Spock do uh, much bigger things. So, yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Step up and do some, have some greatness. Well, that's a great first. <laughs> Day one, Steve. Day, Day one. one uh, <laughs> Ten full hat, that's for sure. Yeah, I got to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do have some feedback. Once again, our friend Fred from the Netherlands has graced us with some feedback. So let's take a listen. Hello, Steve and Dave, and perhaps even Sean. This is Fred from the Netherlands with some feedback for Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 1. This was quite a good episode and actually way beyond my expectations. What I liked a lot is that it was mainly the interaction between Michael Burnham and this New World book. And the performance of Sonico Martin Green and David Ajala was really, really good. With just the two of them, they carried this whole episode. And I actually liked that we didn't see a parallel story of what is momentarily happening with the Discovery. It would distract from this great performance in this first episode. What I also liked is that we actually are more or less taken along with Michael, with her kind of quests to find out in what kind of world she landed up and with all her uncertainties and all her questions and as an audience 
we are taking along and we feel possibly, well, I did the same. What the heck did she land it up in? The world building was also very nice, futuristic in comparison to the 23rd, 24th century and not over the top on the other side. For an episode where there had to be quite some world building and explanation, that was quite action packed. So that was also quite good for a first episode of, of a season in a whole new surrounding, whole new world. And last but not least, I found the CGI, especially of that Molly creature, really fantastic. And the funny thing was when they released her in this pond where you saw other of these creatures jump around in the water. We exactly had the same picture more or less about humpback whales in our 8 o'clock news. And that was about that they are very good for the environment, for the oxygen in the ocean and for CO2 storage. Okay, that's all for now. Greetings, all the best. Fred from the Netherlands. Well, Fred, I'm ecstatic that this episode was beyond your expectations and that you were (laughs) really happy with it. (laughs) Yeah. I, I just, I'm just looking forward to hearing Fred say boo. Yes. <laughs> Every week now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we definitely agree with you that those two carried the entire episode and it was great that we got to experience that awesome performance from them both and didn't have the distraction of what was going on on the Discovery at the same time. I, I agree with you. That probably would have taken away some of uh, Sonequa's and David's performance but yeah this world is definitely new to us so that is awesome and yeah the the CGI of Molly was great mm-hmm. and yeah they do kind of remind me a little of the whales and and yeah they might have a, a similar effect on the universe with uh, what the whales do here on earth with all the um, good stuff that they do for this planet yep once again thank you for your feedback looking forward to it and we will talk to you soon we also have some feedback from jazz as she's jumped into discovery as she (laughs) kind of uh did the what are those uh note that oh yeah summarize yeah. Uh, stuff that's, that's <laughs> the cliff notes, notes of uh, cliff notes, season yeah. one and two and jumped into three so let's hear what jazz has to say hello this is jazz and these are my thoughts on discovery i watched the first episode of the first season and i thought i'd give you my take on that and i watched the first episode of the third season and thought I'd give you my take on that one. I also, in between there, watched some YouTube videos that gave summaries of the first two seasons. There were a lot of plot points to be condensed in a small little period. So, lots of plot lines. But, all very interesting, all the way around. Lots of divergence, left, right, and center. But it was all good. So, I immediately saw that they had the original phasers in the credits in the beginning and i like the michelangelo hand with god techie gloves in the beginning i also liked the landmark event of the senior officers agreeing i thought that was cool so immediately you felt kinship with the members of the crew and the fact that they get along well and had been together for seven years evidently i thought that the airline script was funny considering it was a sci-fi series and i didn't know if they still had planes back then but they probably had the same type of script i found that entertaining before she went off to check out the beacon and she was going by herself and had 19 minutes and i thought that's probably not going to go well but it actually worked out better than i thought i liked the humor of the show thought it was interesting she was called michael so i guess that's a progression sort of like when we call people jerry be for girls or guys or they type people she landed on it and i thought that was a bad idea (laughs) and surprise it's a klingon who has no hair which i found very odd and it reminded me of the old movie enemy mine which i actually really liked but the aliens look very similar with no hair and i'd never really thought of a klingon being bald before so it's a totally different look evidently they had said they hadn't seen a klingon in in a hundred years but we learned that klingons had killed her parents and she didn't look like she was 30 years old so it had to have been more recent than 100 years and i thought it was unusual there were albino klingons never seen that before either and so that was novel i didn't know if he was later killed or if he 
became, I think he became part of the management or hierarchy later on. I know they did mention a, a female priestess, queen type person later on. So I thought that was all very interesting. And the fact that Spock was her adopted brother. So I thought that was made a lot more sense now. Since she had Vulcan qualities, but was still a human. So the two of them, I'm sure, actually got along pretty well, like sibling. The third season, I noticed the progression of the Starfleet symbols in the beginning credits. And the phaser design looked much more advanced. So I thought that was cool. I loved the fact that there was a kitty named Grudge, who was big because he had a thyroid condition. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and let's see. That there were two moons, I noticed that. And I know I'm crossing the streams here, but it reminded me of Tatooine, which is a Star Wars reference. But I think you should be allowed to like both. I loved her punching Book repeatedly, since he was backstabbing Creep and, you know, would turn on a heartbeat. Kept trying to get the dilithium crystals and then leave her in a lurch, I'm sure, besides the status field. He played a bad guy, or the actor did, on Supergirl with a flowing black cape. I think it was called Mandrake. And John Johns had tried to rehabilitate him, and it didn't take at all. And loved the fact that the trans worm was named Molly, and that uh, I decided I liked him more, the book person, after he used his water powers to give her some medicine to help her arm. So evidently he's an environmentalist, which I thought was kind of cool. And he had his own language. I had the closed captions on, and all it said was alien language. So I thought that was kind of cool. It would have been nice if I could have figured out what he was saying, but, you know, maybe they didn't know the people who wrote the closed captions. I saw a preview of the next few episodes, and I thought it looked very nice that he became part of the family. And she found her crew, which I thought was awesome. And let's see. Oh, I also loved that she made the man who was holding down the fort a bona fide officer and helped raise the flag, which I love. And let's see. I think it, it should be, or it seems to me, to be lots of fun and hopeful. And especially since it seems to have a lot of chaos, which seems very 220 to me. You know, that, that seems very appropriate. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It looks like fun. It looks like it has a right amount of humor and some angst and, and certainly a lot of plot twists if the first two seasons are anything to go by. But uh, hopefully you like this review. And uh, once again, this is Jazz. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you, Jazz, for that great feedback. Sean, if you're listening, take <laughs> note that Jazz was able to kind of do a, <laughs> a Cliff Notes version of the first two seasons and jump into season three with us. So definitely glad to, that you're on the ride with us, Jazz. And yeah, we did notice some of the, the new phaser designs and Starfleet emblems that changed in this episode's opening credits. Mm -hmm. And believe me, anytime you want to reference something besides Star mm -hmm. Trek, be our guest. We do it all the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah, we've made several reference, <laughs> non-Star <laughs> Trek references in this uh, episode alone. So, yeah. Yeah, the two moons did seem a little Tatooine. And, of course, the Requiem was a little Mos Eisley as well. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah whatever you can spot. Yeah, definitely. Let us know. It's fun. Yep. So we really appreciate your feedback, Jazz. Looking forward to hearing from you again. And we would love to hear your thoughts on each and every episode this season. And looking forward to interacting on social media with all the great fans. How can the fans interact with us, Dave? Well, they can go to www.fangirlzone.com and click on the contact link where you'll find several ways to contact us via email or through social media. On Twitter, he's at Salyer Steve, and I'm at the real underscore ID underscore Dave. Please review and rate us on iTunes. Good ratings and reviews help other fans of the show find us as there are a lot of other Star Trek Discovery podcasts out there. Tell your friends, and we do hope you're enjoying our podcast. And don't forget to check out the other great Fangirl Zone podcast. I know Jazz also listens to our Winona Earp podcast. The uh, second episode is on October 22nd, just around the corner, and is titled Far From Home. Duh. <laughs> so until then, remember. This is Chief Engineer Steve. The burn was the day the galaxy took a hard left. Dilithium, <laughs> one day, most of it just went boom. Not good. And this is Redshirt Dave. And I have an amazing coincidence to report, Steve. My nickname was Sticky in high school, just like his secret code. Please don't ask. <laughs>